Hey there. What separates artists in training, artists from amateurs? I'm going to paraphrase Chuck Close here, one of my favorite quotes. Close said that amateurs wait around for inspiration and professionals just show up to work. It has nothing to do necessarily with the skill level you're already at, your talent. It has almost everything to do with showing up every day. That's how you form the painting habit. I'm Mary Gilkerson and welcome to my studio this morning. I'm going to talk about the seven steps that will help you form almost any habit, but in particular, help you form the painting habit. Step number one, and ultimately the most important step with forming any habit, is to set a goal. Don't set lots of goals. One to two is the best way to go with that. And know your why. Know what it is that's driving you to do whatever it is that you're setting out to do. Because knowing that why is what is going to keep you on track when the going gets tough. If it's not something you really feel strongly about, if you're not passionate about it and you're not invested in it, you're not going to show up. So make sure you're really, really clear on what your why is. Write it down, print it out, put it up over your desk, put it up over your easel, but put it up where you see it every day so that when things get a little bit difficult or you run into a, an artist block or a brick wall, you can remind yourself what it is that's getting you up and getting you going on that project and towards that goal. Number two, and it's one of the things we've already talked about this month in terms of getting going with um, a daily painting project and with setting up that, that challenge that we're working on over in Artwork Living. Number two is to make it easy to get started. So by that I mean don't put roadblocks in front of yourself. Get as much together as you can so that you don't have to think about it. Remember, we've only got X number of a certain set number of decisions that we can use every day. You don't want to waste those on what size panel am I going to work on on this daily painting project. So set yourself up for success there by planning out as much as you can ahead of time so that you're left to make intuitive decisions while you're painting and that you make it easy to get going on the project. It might be um, setting your studio space up if you're working out in your home. Setting your studio space up in a room that's not used as often so you can leave your paints out rather than having to pick everything up and put it back out again the next day. So make it easy. Number three is establish cues. And these are, this is a real fundamental training tip. And it, I've trained dogs, I've trained horses, I've trained people. And establishing cues works no matter. We're all animals. Doesn't matter which animal we're talking about. This is how you train. You reward positive experiences by establishing cues that are associated with those positive experiences. So, for example, in my studio, some of you already know, some of the cues that I've used for more than 40 years, I put on a pot of decaf coffee when I come into the studio. It's over there right now waiting for me. I put on my trusted apron right here. Again, waiting for me to get started. So those things tell my reptilian and my mammalian brain, my lizard brain and my monkey brain, that it's time to shut out all the rest of that stuff and get down to work. So I begin to shift from the hustle and bustle of outside world, the outside world, and worrying about did I get to the post office today, and start thinking purely about the creative process. Number four is to develop a standard routine. So as soon as you begin to establish some cues and repeat them over and over and over again, you're forming a routine. Routines reinforce habits. So another kind of cue that you could add to your routine might be the kind of music you listen to while you're working. If you don't like to listen to music, don't. You might have silence as the cue to getting to work. But build up a routine 
and try to stick to it. People think that artists are um, averse to routine and it's the exact opposite. The people who accomplish the most have a set routine and that set routine sets them free. So find your routine, make notes of it, and repeat it until you don't have to think about it anymore. Number five, track your progress. There are all kinds of ways to do that. You can do it through iPhone photos that you snap at the end of the day at work day to see where you are at the end of the day and compare those at the end of the week. It can be just looking at your studio reflectively in the morning when you come in and noticing what progress you made from the day before. Hint, you're probably not going to be able to evaluate it very objectively at the end of the day. Better evaluations at the beginning of the next day. But you need to reflect and you need to record and track your progress. Try to do it without too much judgment because uh, it's really hard to distance yourself when you're right on top of a painting and you're in the creative process. Number six, make yourself accountable. It's really closely related to tracking your progress, but you need to make yourself accountable either to yourself through recording it and committing to recording it, but even better, you're going to be much quicker in your process, progress, if you make yourself accountable to somebody else. So if you are in the current five day painting challenge, get a buddy, get them to join you on the challenge so that they can ask you, well, did you finish your painting today? Did you post your painting today? What are you working on for your painting today? Because those kind of accountability questions, if you know they're liable to be asked, will keep you on track. So studies have shown people who have that accountability layer in there as they're trying to develop habits, develop those habits faster. Get somebody to be accountable to. And last but not least, in fact, in some ways it's the most important, reward yourself for progress. Now, I don't mean, you know, the kumbaya, oh, everything you did is just wonderful. Um, that's not real productive. But when you make progress of any sort at all, and you can see that in your tracking, you need to reward yourself. And in fact, you'll even be better off if you name a reward you're going to give yourself when you reach a, a marker point in that tracking. So say you're working on the challenge right now. You could say to yourself, that if you complete all five paintings, you're gonna let yourself buy that gorgeous tube of exquisite blue that you've been looking at for the last month and just couldn't quite justify. Set yourself up for success by working towards that tube of blue paint. So think about a marker that you can shoot for that is backed up and reinforced by your tracking and accountability. Those make it a whole lot more likely that you're going to develop that habit. So just to recount and summarize those things before I take any questions that y'all might have. Number one is to set goals and know your why. Number two is to make it easy. Number three is to establish cues. Number four is to develop a routine. Number five is to track your progress. Number six is to develop accountability, get a partner. And number seven is reward yourself. Don't forget any of those along the way. And if you have any questions about that at this point, I'm gonna pull up, I've got my laptop right here in front of me. I am gonna pull up the page and see if there's anything, anybody has a question about at all. While I'm pulling that up, I just want to remind everyone, it's not too late to join the challenge if you were interested in doing that. The five day challenge is a daily painting challenge that runs from today through, ah, having a hard time getting to the um, actual page, today through Monday with a special bonus day on Tuesday and you can sign up for it or find the sign up over on my website. If you go to marygilkerson.com daily painting challenge you'll see the sign up right there on that page. 
If you can't start right now, no worries. You can start tomorrow, you can start the day after that. We'll run the challenge all the way through the end of the month. So you've got plenty of time, no panics if you haven't set up for success yet. But dive in and get started. This is a great way to get your painting practice off to a good start in 2018. So let's see if we have any questions at all here. And, oh, yay. Hey, Carolyn, it's good to see you. I'm glad that you think those are some good ideas. Susan says, who's from North Carolina who's willing to have a buddy? Yay. Good for you, Susan, looking for a buddy. Um, for encouragement and accountability. Take a look in the free Facebook group, Susan, in Artwork Living, and put a shout out out there and I think you'll find somebody pretty quickly who's willing to be your accountability partner there. Um, it's not letting me go back through all of the comments. If I miss any comments that you've or questions you've asked um, live, I'll come back to them after I hop off. Jeffrey says, art abandonment group. I left them. Hmm. I'm not sure what you're talking about there, Jeffrey. Art abandonment? Huh. Let me know what you're talking about. Happy to answer that, whatever that is. Um, oh, Betsy says, what is the first one? Sorry, I missed that. The first one is to set goals. Decide what you want to accomplish and don't set them way far out. I actually don't really even like annual goals anymore. I like to set quarterly goals or six month goals. But for the challenge, Think about what you would want to accomplish during those five days. It might be to speed up your painting study execution time by five minutes. You might want to go from 40 minutes to 30 minutes. You might want to loosen up a little bit or simplify your shapes a little bit. Any one of those is a perfectly fine goal. The challenge is set up in a way that it will, if you follow the guidelines there, um, speed you up because that time constraint forces you to loosen up and you can only go from simple to complex shapes if you do that. You can still post in the group and you can post on my website with the challenge group if you don't follow those guidelines exactly. There are no challenge police. So I want to remind everybody, be kind to each other. Um, there, are, there are no demerits for not following the rules. Um, because rules are guidelines, they're not rules. So I'm setting that up in a way that will loosen you up and speed you up. But if that's not what you want to do, don't feel constrained by that. The main goal of the challenge is to get you in the studio painting. If that is accomplished, woohoo, and we'll celebrate at the end, party time on Tuesday. But I don't want people to berate each other because they're not doing it exactly the same as they think it should be done. I've seen just a little bit of that over in the group. Um, Helen says, I love to, would love to join the challenge. Love your works. How do I sign up? Helen, head over to marygilkerson.com. And if you don't want to try to navigate any further, there's a yellow bar at the top of the website. And you'll see... Five Day Painting Challenge up in that yellow bar at the very top. So you can get to it right from the front page. So no worries there. Just go straight to my, my website. Um, Donna says, no rules, no rush, just paint. Right on, Donna. You got it. You know me well. The rules are not rules. They're guidelines. There's no rush. Done is better than perfect. Just get started. If you wait around to tr uh, attempt perfection, You'll still be waiting, and we'll be on to day 10 instead of just day 5. A lot of people intend to continue after that fifth day. So don't wait around on it. And let me see if there are any others. I hate the way Facebook does this because they are showing just the current comments and not the early the ones. So, does this because ah. they see if I can get that. Just the current comments and not the I'm getting myself talking at the same time. Um, Jan Session says, have fun. Absolutely, Jan. Exactly. That backs up what Donna was saying. Uh, and that becomes a really important uh, part of develop, developing a habit. 
goes back to that section when I talked about developing cues. If your experience is unpleasant, if it is, and it's not all going to be pleasant all the way across, but if your overall experience with what you're working on is very unpleasant, you're going to resist the habit. So you want to develop cues from things that make it pleasant. So if you really love the act of looking at paint and colors, go for that because that becomes a little reward, which is what a cue is. A cue is a little reward that's repeated over and over because it gives a dopamine signal to your brain that you have just had a pleasant experience. If the feeling of mixing paint makes you feel good, make sure you give yourself plenty of time to paint. Remember that the challenge time does not include paint mixing time. So you can do all your prep ahead and then dive into painting. So I had suggested in the email that went out to the group who've already signed up that they start with 40 minutes. Now our goal is to get to 20 minutes, but start with 40 minutes so it feels a little bit more doable. It's not cheating. Start with 40 minutes, set it on your timer, get your biggest brush, your biggest knife, and dive in to go big shapes first. Get those big shapes down. And if it is a pleasant experience at 40 minutes, then tomorrow back that clock up to 35 minutes. Keep it a pleasant experience. If that still works, then back the clock up another five minutes on Saturday. So then you're doing it at 30 minutes. If you progress like that, five minutes a day that you're shaving off and it's still a pleasant experience, then everything you do setting yourself up for that day's painting experience becomes a cue. It doesn't have to be coffee. You might be drinking tea. It might be, um, no, don't drink Cokes and sodas. I have a sugar thing and soda thing. Don't do that. That's not good for you. Drink tea. Drink something that is, is good for you. Keep it away from your paint box so you're not drinking your paint, but establish those cues that lead towards and reinforce the positive experience. If there's a certain kind of music that gets your energy level up, then play that while you're working. Whatever it is that gets you in the flow and gets your energy going is what you want to do. So... Ann says, I'm in North Carolina, Old Fort, about 25 miles east of Asheville. Love the idea of accountability partners. Um, so if you're in North Carolina, and if you're not in the Artwork Living Group yet, go hop over there and join it. It'll take us a second to get you in because we have to do that manually if you're not in there already. Um, because we're trying to put together some of those meetups and accountability groups. But I think it's a great idea to find somebody else that you can be accountable with. It really helps. That's the beauty of being in a course or taking a class or a workshop is that when you're in a class or a course or a workshop, you have somebody who's the teacher that you're accountable to. And it's a role we're really familiar with. And that really is the main reason to take a course. It is not even so much the information that's imparted. It's the fact that psychologically we've set ourselves up with an accountability partner who's going to hold us accountable for completing the tasks. When we've got skin in the game like that, we're much more likely to finish the process out. So grab that accountability partner. Linda says, is your phthalo blue red shade? No, it's green. Um, I use Thalo Blue Green Shade. So the two blues that I use are Ultramarine Blue and Thalo Blue Green Shade. And what Linda's talking about is that I suggested that everybody simplify their palette down. I use just a uh, double primary palette, so a warm and a cool of each of the primary colors plus white. Your palette is not a requirement at all for the challenge. Use the palette you want to. Um, there is at least one person, now I can't think of who it was that's doing it, but there's at least one person in the group who's using a modified Zorn palette. And Zorn, the Zorn palette is um, mainly earth colors, but they're very simple colors 
yellow ochre. Now, I'm not going to be able to cite it off the top of my head. Um, black, I think it's burnt sienna, and I'll have to go look it up. But when they're used together in that combination, it's a very limited palette because of the juxtaposition of the colors. It looks much more intense than it actually is. You can accomplish an awful lot with very little. The challenge is far less about color than it is about establishing those basic shapes, the five to seven shapes, three to five values that you have in a thumbnail, very, very quickly. So don't let yourself get hung up on color. If you get those shape patterns right from a thumbnail, it's going to work pretty much no matter what color combination you throw in there. Um, Kyle says, is your crimson alizarin? It's not. Um, I use an updated version of crimson, alizarin crimson. It's a naphthal crimson. Most true alizarin crimsons, whether you're talking about watercolor, acrylic, oils, no matter what it is, true alizarin crimson is kind of fugitive. It's not that strong a pigment. It's very affected by light. Very few paint manufacturers actually use real alizarin crimson anymore for their alizarin crimson. Most of them are naphthal crimson, which is much, much, much more permanent. I use um, the Williamsburg Carl's Crimson, which has a combination of naphthal crimson pigments. And but that's when I'm painting in oils. When I'm painting in acrylics, I use quinacridone. Quinacridone is a synthetic pigment that has been developed in the latter part of the 20th century. Very, very strong tinting strength without having a lot of um, light fastness problems. It's expensive, though. So a lot of people avoid it because of that. Quinacridone is a much more expensive pigment, whether it's in the yellows, golds, reds, or oranges. But it's a gorgeous one. In watercolor, the same thing. I'm either using Natfall Crimson or Quinacridone because they're just a whole lot more permanent than the alizarin. Um, Sheila, naphthal crimson is not exactly the same as naphthal red. So think of naphthal as being an overall family of pigments. And so there's some naphthal reds that are bluer, which makes them more crimson, and some that are more warm that makes them more of a vermilion cadmium red color. So usually when you look at the label, the pigment name for one that's a, a vermilion or a cadmium red substitute will say naphthal red. That's the actual pigment red, look almost exactly like cadmium, and naphthal crimson is going to be a cool red and look almost exactly like alizarin crimson. Um, let's see, Betsy says, what brand do you usually use for a palette knife? Uh, for palette knife work, for paint, I'm using in oils, I use Williamsburg because it's a thick, um, heavy body to paint. It is pure pigment and the vehicle, the oil. And so a lot of, a little paint goes a long way with Williamsburg. Same thing with Sennelier. I also use Gamblin, which is another really high quality paint. Um, I use a little bit of Michael Harding and um, Blue Ridge oils are the main ones I use, but Williamsburg is my go-to, and then I use Gamblin for certain colors, and the others are ones that I just love playing around with. They're all the same quality, so roughly. Um, so any one of those is gonna work for palette knife. Gamblin is a little less heavy than the other three, but Gamblin makes the absolute best whites in the world, so I love their whites. That's a, a rabbit hole I can go down for a long time. Um, yeah, Sheila, if the broadcast was interrupted, it was that phone ringing. So I will hop on later and take more questions this afternoon if anybody has any others. That's all for now. Bye-bye, y'all. Happy painting.